welcome to the Dowie Expert Series podcast. I'm Robert Coons. Uh, with me today is Mark Wiley. Mark is the owner of the Tambuli Media Group, and uh, he has been publishing in the martial arts for decades now. Um, he is also a senior practitioner of both Southern Chinese martial arts and um, I believe uh, Filipino martial arts. Is that right? Correct. And uh, he'll be talking to us today about also his extensive experience in the Taoist scene, both in North America and uh, Asia. So uh, thank you very much for joining us, Mark. You're welcome. Thank you so much for the invitation. Appreciate it. Well, you know, we have a little bit of history going back. Um, the only book that I've ever published uh, in, you know, internal uh, elixir cultivation was published by Tambuli Media. So I owe you uh, a great deal of historical thanks. And uh, I really look forward to this interview because you're one of the people who makes our community do all the wonderful things that it does. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so, it's a terrific book. I'm, I'm happy to have published it. And, um, you know, we're going to have you on my podcast to talk about the Taoist practices that are contained in that book. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, so to get started, uh, I'd like to ask a little bit about, about what you do in terms of your, your work within this, this field that we, that we study. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess we can say, um, in 1979, I started martial arts. Um, I'm 54 now. And, um, because I got, was getting picked on at school and then that just, opens the door to everything else in the world that you and I and people like us do. Um, and um, I was watching Kung Fu movies that were on TV back then, the Shaw Brothers and Golden Harvest films. And in those films at you know, nine, 10, 11 years old, I'm watching, I was being mesmerized by the couple of things, more than just the fighting scenes, it was the teachers that the Knights Errant you know, went to learn from. You know, and um, they were always like some old guy. So there's wisdom there who had some secret techniques, a secret manual. He knew Chinese medicine of some kind, bone setting, herbology, acupuncture of something and was very wise. And I thought, that's what I want to be when I grow up. An old Chinese guy who has all that. <laughs> and um, so then. You, you start moving into the philosophy, into the Chinese medicine, into meditation, into Qigong practices and acupuncture and life just, it just takes on a life of its own. Um, and I, I was bullied a lot as a kid. I was, you know, short and dorky, kind of like still now. <laughs> and, um, and I grew up in chronic pain. So since birth, I was three months premature, spent three months in an incubator, and could, you know, I was blue, the lungs weren't fully open, my muscles weren't fully developed. So I've been in chronic pain, at least for the first 32 or 33 years, chronic daily headaches. When I was in high school, I was taking 14 pain pills a day, not 14 total quantity of different migraine and muscle relaxers and headache things um, a day. So I started on a path of toward natural wellness, because that's what I read about in, in all the books on Chinese martial arts and Japanese martial arts. And, and these guys in the movies weren't surgeons, you know, they were doing secret stuff with chi and, and herbs. <laughs> so I started traveling around to meet different people and um, ended up traveling to six or seven Asian countries and studying Chinese medicine and meditation and altered states of consciousness and um, Qigong and Taoism and, and different things. And, that naturally led into um, publishing and writing about it because the Kung Fu master in the movies always had a manual. And I was like, well, then I need a manual and uh, <laughs> kind of silly, but here we are. And, you know, it's been, been publishing and writing in magazines and books and blogs and websites for decades. I think 1990 was my first article in Black Belt Magazine. That's awesome. Hey, and I wouldn't know anything about being short and dorky. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> um, but uh, no, that's really cool. And so what what came of this ultimately is that um, you've been in publishing for quite a long time now, and you have 
uh, not only written your own books, um, which are about a, a wide range of topics too. You've also helped a lot of people to um, also talk about their their arts and their practices. And so you um, you currently are um, running Tambuli, which is a really, really cool publishing company. And it's it's really broad, I think, compared to a lot of other publishing companies. If if I'm if I'm not wrong, and um, you you can tell me about it in a second. But I get the impression that Tambuli starts with a strong basis in sort of martial arts and self cultivation. But then there's also, as you say, expansion into into other realms of wellness too. So can you give us a little bit of background about the company? Yeah, um, and thank you for the opportunity. So. Um... I published my first article in 1990, and then in 1994, my first book was published. Um, and then that publisher, well, I was horrible at writing. Th this is all part of the journey. I was getting C's and D's in English class in middle school and high school. Uh, horrible. I still can't diagram a sentence. I don't know what half of the things are. Um, but I wanted my my Eskrima teacher, one of them, Angel Cabalas. Uh, who was the father of a scream in the United States. He opened up the first club in 1966. Uh, he asked me to write a book about his style. And I was like, I don't know how to write a book, but I got plenty of martial art books. I'll just read, you know, look at them and get an outline. And it got turned down by 14 publishers. And uh, they all said, yeah. And then the, the one editor of North Atlantic Books, the publisher sent me a nice postcard that said, Mr. Wiley, you're no writer. And I... I still have that nice postcard because it motivated me to learn how to write and publish. So when I was in college, um, my first two years, I'd go to the library between every class and read books that they happen to have there on writing, on editing, on publishing, on printing, on marketing, everything I could about books. Uh, and then I finally got, and then I sent the book manuscript to Tuttle Publishing in Japan, which is like the big get for me back then with all the classic books. And they picked it up and signed me on for more books and flew me to Japan to become their editor. I, it completely changed my life. Yeah. So in 19, I think 96, I, I forget, five, six, seven, somewhere in there, I became the, uh, the full-time editor in Tokyo for martial art books at Tuttle Publishing. And just a few years before, I'm no writer. I, I didn't know anything. And um, it's just an amazing turnaround in my life because of that request from my teacher. And so I started writing books and writing articles for the magazines. And then what happened was in 2010, I had written a new book and I couldn't get anybody to publish it. And it's like, well, they're like, well, Kindle and eBooks and people aren't reading martial art books anymore. YouTube killed the market. Every You can get all the information for free and in 2D and real time. You don't need to look at pictures. And so everybody turned down my book I wrote about disarming, Iskrima disarming. And I thought, well, I'll just publish it myself. And that started Tembuli Media. <laughs> um, and because I had all the skills, I knew how to design, edit, write. I had edited probably 65 or 70 books between Tuttle and Inside Kung Fu and articles for Journal of Asian Martial Arts, um, Martial Arts Illustrated that I was on their editorial staff or in charge of their publishing. So I started it with that book and then a book on arthritis and, and joint pain. And that then gave me the money to print the third book. And then the fourth, and then I thought, hmm, maybe I can publish other people's work, you know? And that's how I was lucky to get your book. And, um, and really the focus is basically what's my focus. And my focus is how in general is, or philosophy is, um, how to pursue excellence in your own life. And the way to do that is to feel good, is to think well, is to have energy, is to not be afraid. So that's martial arts, Eastern philosophy, and uh, natural wellness. So those are basically, and then some poetry is in there. And that's basically the, the Tambuli kind of slots uh, for, for content, articles and books, yeah. That's like that's a great background story because you know previously in communications with you I'd, I'd heard bits and pieces of it but having it all put together like that um, it's it's very powerful the the transformation that can happen when um, you know let's say our, our teachers ask us to do something right 
And then all of a sudden you're in the hot seat and you're like, oh, but I, I do have to do it now. So I'll have to become a, a more powerful person right. um, and, and, uh, and, and a more talented person. So that, that's a really cool story. And Tambuli publishes a, a very uh, dynamic range of books. So there's books that I've seen um, that are published by you that um, are hard to find in other places. A lot of stuff pertaining. Uh, I saw also um, things about like Eagle Claw. I think it was uh, Dale. Um, uh, Dale the, 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 book is Iron Palm. Iron, Iron Palm. Palm. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and other books like that, that these days would be very hard to find anywhere else. So yeah, it's, it's really cool what you're doing. Uh, one of the other interesting things uh, about your, your project is that you have um, a wealth of knowledge about Southern Chinese martial arts. And I think that it's a really interesting thing for, you know, our sort of the Dawi community we're very ensconced in northern China from, you know, Henan up to up to Shandong. And so we don't get to talk to southern stylists as much, but the southern styles are every bit as rich as the northern styles. There's a lot of stuff going on in them. And I think there's a lot of complementary information that we could learn from. So can you tell us about your background in southern Chinese martial arts a bit? Yeah, sure. So in 1984, I guess is when I started Southern Arts with Wing Chun. And um, and then in 1993, I started, uh, which is my art till now, uh, Five Ancestor Fists, which is called Ngo Chokun in Hokkien or Wuzu Chuan in Mandarin. And that's from um, Fujian province, from Chuanzhou, a, a place called Chuanzhou in Fujian province. And it is a culmination of five of the most popular styles in Chuanzhou um, of the time. And one teacher named in Mandarin, Kai Yu Ming, in Hokkien, Chua Gyuk Ming, um, he kind of collected five of the seven main styles into a new style. But you can't find any of the, it's not like he just combined like two forms from monkey and two from crane and something from Damo style or whatever. Uh, uh, he took the concepts and the elements. So it's like palms of the monkey and the low techniques and jumps and the um, steps of the Lohan and, um, you know, the the straight tablet body of of the uh, grand ancestor boxing and the fingers of the crane and the, and the uh, softness of the crane and the iron body and internal training of Dhamma or Bodhidharma and Datsun Chuan um, into it. So... The style is quite uh, rich and deep in flavor, and there's so many forms. It's like insane. Uh, but some, a lot of some, a lot of the southern styles have like four or five forms, right? Most of the Fujian styles have five forms. Wing Chun has three plus the dummy, and and but uh, most have about five. We have what's called the five big roads or five main forms that all the branches know, and then after that, there's another like fifty. And like, and then the two man sets and the weapon sets is kind of insane um, because there becomes a lot of repeat after a while um, in the movements. But the style is um, it opens up with something called Ki Kun, Q I K U N, and it means commencement fist, not Chi, uh, um, different character. And that opening set has eight movements, and those eight movements are the essence of every single thing in the style. So the concepts of float, sink, swallow, spit, you know, um, turning, breathing in, breathing out, exhaling, matching your breath with the movement and your intention, just like Qigong, uh, tension, relax, tension, relax, every other movement. So, you, you know, you're building the, uh, the essence or releasing the Jing at the end. And um, it opens up every single form. So it's like the most important thing. And um, so focus on that is like a training on, unto itself. There's not a separate Qigong practice, so that's basically the Qigong practice. Um, but a lot of people who do this style, we practice Jian Zhuang, um, where we get from whomever, <laughs> wherever you get it from. A lot of the other guys do eight brocade. Just you know, they're just bringing Qigong practices into it. Um, but it's quite uh, an interesting mid to close range style. 
you know, short body, everything in arm, arm distance, no long stances. I mean, super long, like in the Northern, there's a couple of like Lotus stances with the legs twisted on the ground, but not many, not many, the short Southerners, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. And, um, the, the Wing Chun is like, also comes from some snake and crane and herme and but it's like it's a very truncated system you know it doesn't have a lot of extraneous techniques and then the five ancestor we had quite a few quite a lot of techniques you know and i was lucky in tambuli so in 1911 a book was written on the style by one of the first students of the founder and a few copies were printed and then it, the printing press was blown up in war and this I've had a photocopy from my Sifu for a long time and he always wanted to translate it. And then we translated it and published it in 2012. It's called, um, some people call it Chinese Jiu Jitsu Complete because Jiu Jitsu is gentle art. So it's Chinese gentle art complete or compendium. And we call it the Bible of Gocho and Tambuli published that. Yeah. And then a couple of other people have borrowed it and published it through their lines in other countries. <laughs> <laughs> with different photos yeah yeah that that happens more than more than is good yeah. um so now uh i wanted to mention also that the the thing about southern people um there i have a really funny really brief story which is i was up in um in Lugu, which is one of the major tea plantations in, in Taiwan. And uh, I saw a, a very old farmer standing in horse stance pouring tea. And I said through the interpreter, because they can only speak um, Fujian dialect and, right. and Japanese, Are, do you practice martial arts? And he said, no, no, this is my farming posture. If I'm afraid if I sit in a chair, I'll die. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So your martial arts walk is your everyday walk. Yeah. Um, so okay, that's that's very cool, and you have been also teaching these arts for a long time. But before we get into that, I have one burning question in my mind because of my uh, the depths of my ignorance about these things. Five ancestor fist has had an outsized impact on Japanese martial arts, hasn't it? Um, uh, it is believed to. Okay, yeah, it might have been one of the things that that, yeah. uh, that they brought back with them, and and the the opening routine is that what sort of the same kind of like opening the body and creating tension and then releasing the tension and sort of like how they practice san san chen. So, yeah, so we have we call it sam chen, uh, in Hokkien or sanjan, in Mandarin or san chen in Japanese. So uh, historically, a lot of people have claimed that. Well, Japanese martial arts come from Okinawan martial arts. Okinawan martial arts were highly influenced by Southern Chinese martial arts. And they like to attach white crane to that or, or shouting crane, any kind of crane to that, because there's a crane uh, form in Okinawan martial arts. However, there's more in common with the five ancestor fists with the what they call incense shop boxing, um, which we call Lohan or Arhat boxing. Same thing because the Lohan, uh, the, the monks worked in these incense shops when they were, the martial arts were taught through there, not in the temple. Um, there's more in common with that than the crane and our San Chen is very similar to like Goju and Wei Chi and uh, the different Okinawan ones. So I can't say 100%, but I would say it's highly more likely. And even some of the forms are, are quite similar to Okin Okinawan and, and you know karate movements and then the japanese are kind of like like a northern shaolin the kind of like the movements from the okinawans to the to J the japanese got kind of longer more streamlined uh kind of like if you see northern shaolin versus you know hungar or something uh a little bit different in flavor um but yes that influence is a thousand percent there and um yeah and the art left china really and spread because the founder came to the went to the Philippines in the 1800s, and then he set up a school there, and then he went back to China and sent his son over to run the school, and that's how where I learned was in the Philippines. I made some 20 something trips there, not only to learn Filipino martial arts, but to study with my Sifu Alex Ko, who passed away in 2012, uh, 2015, April 12, 2015, and um, 
that club has uh, so old and has been there forever. And uh, Otsuka Sensei in Tokyo took a group there in the 70s or early 80s. Uh, we have some videos to to exchange with our club called Benkiam. Uh, their forms and our and our forms and their applications and our applications and a lot of Weichi guys have come there to to the club to see and exchange and trace their lineages and origins. Mm -hmm. That's very, very cool. And so um, this gives me, this is a good segue for, for another topic that um, mm -hmm. is near and dear to your heart, which is Filipino martial arts. So you have also an extensive background in Filipino martial arts. And we, you know, at Dao, we were mainly focused on, on, Chinese practices, but I think there's an interesting segue and question, which is that um, in your experience or looking through the the um, culture of these practices, do you think there's any relationship there between Chinese martial arts and Filipino martial arts? Um, I'm going to say no, but I mean, I'm going to say no linearly. <laughs> so the Filipino martial arts have been there um it goes back to tribal arts bow and arrow blow gun spear you know sword and shield um on one of my trips there i went down to mindanao and interviewed and got armed scouts to take me into the jungle to meet some tribes and um i met with a revolutionary leader and i met with the tribal leaders and i have a you can't see but i have a shield and a sword hanging here from a gift that was given to me from them and those arts were there before the Spanish came in um, and in the 1500s. And then um, Magellan came over and they had big fights and everybody think, oh, the Spanish influenced the Filipino sword fighting and stick fighting and whatever, maybe. Um, and then the Filipinos around World War II, all of a sudden the arts started getting codified meaning they were wearing uniforms, they were standing in lines, they had belt ranks, and they were calling out commands before it was muestración or I demonstrate and you follow. And I just give you a million examples. And then all of a sudden there's curriculums and lines and they got that from the martial arts brought over by American servicemen. And then the JKA, Japan Karate Association, Aikido ended up in the Philippines and clubs started coming up and the Filipinos were like, wow, you can make a living teaching this? So they started copying those formats. And so now what we see today is like so different from back when, but there's not much of a Chinese influence there. Although the Chinatown uh, Binondo, it's called in the Philippines in Manila, where I learned five ancestor fist is like almost 400 years old. It's the oldest, they say, they, they, there's some articles online that say it's the oldest Chinatown ever uh, and it's still in existence. And um, uh, and there was quite a few Kung Fu clubs there. And I studied Wu style Tai Chi there and Qigong and Zhan Zhuang and, um, and different things. Um, but relating to Chinese martial arts, I will tell you that the Philippine arts are better and faster at getting you into a no mind and a flow state, like a state that you want to be into for a meditative state faster than I found in the Chinese arts because you're starting out learning weapons. And unlike Chinese arts, you're not learning forms and then a two-man set, you're learning counters against angled strikes and then you're free flowing those counters against somebody striking at you. So everything it's like a stick and a dagger or sword or two sticks and it's swinging at you and you're like, it go, your, your brain goes into no mind. You know how hard it is to get into no mind meditating? Everybody's like mindfulness, mindfulness. No, you got to get past that to really raise your elevation of, of your psychological state, right? Your states of consciousness. And the, doing the uh, Philippine arts will, when you get into fast drilling uh, with metal weapons, even if they're not sharp, man, <laughs> it is so fast at getting into that. You have to flow and move with your weapons so that you don't get hit. And they don't really have that training anymore in the Chinese arts so much, you know, unless you're involved in Sanda or something in kickboxing. But um, so I found that with the Filipino arts, I had ability to faster get into a, a state of consciousness and a meditative state fast and a flow state fast, way faster than just meditating or doing qigong. 
but they don't have any of those practices because there's no really indigenous philosophy in the Philippines. There's no temples like Angkor Wat or Thailand or Burma. It's a Catholic country. It's the only Catholic country in because Spain ruled it for 334 years and then the U.S. came in. So it's essentially a Catholic country. Yeah. That was a very, very thoughtful and excellent response. So now you have been um, also teaching for, for ages and you've seen lots of students come through your doors. Um, I'd like to ask with your experience. So I, I have a couple of questions. I have the first question and then a follow-up question, but I'll say them both now. Um, the first question is when you, um, in your experience, both teaching, publishing, writing your own books, and also publishing other people's books, um, do you have advice for people who are, let's say, in the mid to late beginner stages or early intermediate stages of martial arts practice that can help propel them forward? So that's the first question. Um, okay, yes. <laughs> uh, the first thing would be is to understand your reason why you're doing martial arts or internal arts, right? Meditation, Qigong, Tai Chi, or Kung Fu, or whatever. Understand why you're doing it and for whom you're doing it. Because um, a lot of people quit. Most people quit fast, you know? And then there's weirdos like us who stay in too long. <laughs> we can't quit. We don't know who we are without it. Um, but yeah, if you know why you're doing it, if it's just for self-defense because you're getting picked on or for physical thing or for social, whatever, um, and that's your goal, then just aim for that and leave it at that and you won't get frustrated. But if you're in there for enlightenment, if you want to be Jet Li uh, or Donnie Yen, because Jet Li is a little earlier generation, um, then you have to be in the correct martial art that you want to be in to achieve those goals, right? Um, so I think knowing what, why you're doing it and what your goal is and what you want to get out of it is super, super important. And then when you do, when you have that, then I would say read, but most people are now watching <laughs> on YouTube, uh, videos on the style, uh, especially ones that have culture and history in them, because you'll get the most out of it. If you kind of engage yourself in the, in the, culture of the art that you're studying. So let's just say Chinese martial arts, you know, go to a Chinatown, go to a Chinese restaurant, don't order Pong Pao chicken and sweet and sour pork, or please ask them for the Chinese menu, try something different that is not Americanized, right? Um, look at some books, a lot of PDFs online, go, go buy um, Robert Kunz's uh, Taoist Elixir book. And read about it so you kind of know you're not just sitting there doing an exercise or a practice you have some information behind it as to why that practice is there and why you're being asked to do it and what you can gain from it so i think that's really the best advice and then keep keep looking for a teacher who can really guide and mentor you not it, not someone who's just maybe good at the techniques but who's like a good teacher which means he's a good he or she is a good listener and that they can explain some philosophy, psychology, and higher principles rather than just barking things out. Because if you're going to be there for a long time and spend a lot of your month there, a couple of days a week or whatever it's going to be, you want to make sure that you're, you're um, evolving along the way. Yeah. yeah, so basically immerse yourself in it and make sure that you get the get enough of the right kind of information mm -hmm. talk to the people that are going to help you to do what you want to do constructively and the reason why i ask you this i don't ask this question to everybody but you know you you've been at this for longer than most of us and also your your trajectory is very interesting because um you've you've tried harder than most of us and been successful at it so that means that you know we have a lot to we have a lot to learn from you um, the next question is, is out of left field. It's a little bit of a different question, but it's always fascinating to me to look at, um, in Chinese martial arts, we all use many of the same language structures that we use, you know, Jing, Qi, Shen, 
um, you know, gin, three treasures, etc. Uh, yeah. What I'm wondering though, because um, there's no way that I mean, there's there's a lot of diversity in the northern styles even, but once you have the the rift of the very different styles of north and south, I'm wondering those terminologies that we come across that we often will you know sort of overlook. Let's say chi, for instance. Um, do you have any insight about how how chi or similar concepts might be engaged with differently relative to north and south? Hmm, that's a very good question. Um, engage with differently. Or we could even we can even reframe the question a bit. So the southern schools have a lot of literature, um, as well as as well as the northern schools, and um, but my understanding, which is you know admittedly extremely lim limited, but coming from a from a Okinawan karate background originally, um, they're really into this text that they say came from China called the Bubishi. I think it's called Bubishi. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and so it's it's like a very classic sort of southern Shaolin type text. And looking at it, the the feeling of it really comes off differently to me than, let's say, you know, the, the classical documents of Xing Yi, which is the art that I practice now. And so when we look at the difference between the cultural framing of northern and southern styles, I guess that's sort of the meta question. Um, okay. How do you how do you interpret that? Well, I think in the north, um, and I'm not trying to be. Um, I apologize if I'm wrong in the statement and I'm not trying to be critical in any way, but I think historically the Northerners have been more educated um, than the Southerners who are mainly farmers, you know, like their livelihood is farming, um, uh, manufacturing, selling, and a lot of Northerners um, it's who have been involved with martial arts have been around, um, you, you would say like a scholar rather than a warrior, you know, a, an actual learned more doc a more learned doctor than just a ditta isang, just, just a ditta or trauma traumatology doctor like the southern kung fu doctors uh which is massage tuina um guasa scraping and things like that um and the northern arts are have a big a, a, a i don't know big is the word bigly is that open <laughs> have a um uh they have a lot of a, a large canon of texts on internal arts development in Chinese medicine, Yellow Emperor's Classic, and all, all kinds of different ones, um, treaties on the spleen and stomach, and on and on. And the Southern arts have more uh, application manuals of martial arts. So their Chinese medicine in the Southern arts is about where to strike in the points, right? And then how to do bone setting and herbal plasters. And in the North, it's uh, the Jing Lo or the acup acupuncture channels, the meridian channels, the points, uh, liver, spleen, you know, the, 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 the horary clock of hours, how many, two hours in every, every major organ section around the clock, uh, tra trauma, internal medicine, it, it seems to be a little broader. So when they're saying things like um, qi, they're talking about, you know, uh, prenatal qi, postnatal qi, I mean, you know, and uh, development of chi, the flow of chi, blockage of chi. And in the Southern arts, the, at least in the manuals, it's like hit them here to block the blood, block the chi, disrupt the flow of the energy. It's more combat application than healing and the healing stuff. It's good for, for uh, like bones and bleeding and bruises, but all kinds of internal stuff. It's not from my readings, it's not been as well developed and the internal work. A lot of the internal stuff that we get in the South comes from the North, you know. So, yeah, that's that's fascinating because one of the things that um, that suggests to us is that we can do also um, cross comparisons and, and find you know be able to extract even more information by looking into sort of both approaches, right? That. That's that's a that's a pretty interesting idea going forward because it seems like in in the in the martial arts or in spiritual practice, if once you know what you're doing, there's kind of a little bit of opportunity to to do some experimentation. Um, but so the overall, uh, I think we've gotten a, a basic picture of of who you are and and your background and um, and your publishing company. And and also your your view of the the martial arts, but one of the questions that we ask everybody is uh, 
where do you see this going? And and I'll, I'll split it into two questions. So one is, um, where's Tambuli Media going in the next decade? And then the next question is, what do you think is going to happen to the scene overall? Because you're you're doing a really interesting, um, you know, project, and so you have insight into it that that most of us don't. Um. Yeah, it's a struggle. I, I will say it's a struggle. Um, niche publishing, and we're a small niche publisher, is really hard to to move. We don't have big marketing dollars. We don't have advertising dollars. You know, um, it's hard to get in the bookstores. We get books in the bookstores, but everything is on consignment. So whatever doesn't sell in by the next order period, usually a quarter gets returned and we have to pay for the return. So it's like you think you made all these sales and then half of it comes back and you're like, now I got extra stock sitting here. You know, um, we really depend on the authors promoting their stuff on their social media with their emails at their seminars and so forth. But some of the authors aren't doing a lot, you know, it's, it, and the COVID just knocked all of that down. You know, I used to be among a, a group of people here in Philadelphia who promoted two big banquets, martial art banquets a year. And one, one, um, for Chinese New Year, of course, you know, we have a couple hundred martial artists and Tai Chi practitioners, and we have a big banquet and demonstrations and all kinds of stuff. And the other was a, a interdisciplinary martial art and healing arts conference, where it would be a full day or two days with catered Chinese food in a big Chinese banquet hall with demonstrations and classes going on at the same time and people shifting through teachers and, and it stopped all through COVID. It just dead stop. And it's hard to get that momentum back again. Um, we've slowed down on the amount of books that we're publishing just because people aren't buying as much as they did. Um, I'd say in 20, we started in 2013 and then by 2016, the sales were down across by half and, you know, 2018, 19 by quarter. And now we're just like, okay, <laughs> you know, uh, we need, we need to see what we're doing. So we started a podcast called transformations and we're on the, we just put up the 27th episode one per week and have all different people on there. Um, about internal arts, regular martial arts, but really it's about the trend. The focus is on the transformative nature of experience, whatever that's a Kundalini experience or a cold water diving, deep diving experiences, but all that relates to again, uplifting and evolving the human spirit and finding excellence in your life, same kind of uh, idea. So we're going to be starting two or three more podcasts or hosting them for other people um, along the lines of our publishing silos, you know, to kind of just bring more attention to our projects, our books, and to the content of our friends and writers and, and authors too. It, it's hard. It's a hard, um, more people are self-publishing now, but the quality of the books is horrible. Not all of them, but quite a bit. I have some of our Tumbuli authors have done some of their own books and they're not copy edited. They're not laid out correctly. The captions are off to the side and it's just like they're just cranking it out and it's flooding the market with subpar content right so then people are less inclined to buy more these kinds of books um but we'll keep trying we'll keep doing different things um and we're going to see where that leads us we just moved into podcasting so uh and then doing online courses so we'd like to put together more courses um and have books that support the courses um, and in the arts, what I'm seeing is, and I talked to a lot of people, old masters in New York City, uh, I was I was in Boston recently, and also New York City talking with masters, you know, 20, 30 years over my age. And what they're seeing is that the martial arts is turning back, turning back to pre 1970s, before the Bruce Lee boom, and then the martial art boom where everybody had schools and everybody was doing everything. And then it, and it went from there to black belt clubs and birthday parties and family martial arts to now it's mostly kids and it's not really martial arts. And then MMA kind of took a spotlight. Um, 
but like boxing, people don't do MMA in their old age. It's too hard to keep up with and do, even though it's, it's a huge spectator sport. And a lot of the traditional teachers have closed their schools. There's not enough people coming. So, but the qual quality of the students that are coming and the training has, has improved because instead of having, you know, 70 or hundred students and you've got to crank through classes and get them through ranks, you're back to teaching in your basement or your backyard. Like when you'd find the old master, you know, doing whatever and he didn't have a school and you would learn. So it's kind of like back to the old days where Hungar can be Hungar, not have to be Hungar birthday parties and, you know, and Qigong can be Qigong. And the, and the objective for the teacher is to teach students well. And the objective is the student is to learn well. And the objective is not to, I got to get how many people in to pay the bills, you know, because it's no longer the living. So I think that's good for the martial arts and the traditional arts will, will shore themselves up again. Yeah. Well, you know what they say, a setback is a setup for a comeback. So <laughs> there you yeah. go. Yeah. Well, this has been, this has been really, really fun. So, um, Please stay with me for, for a couple of minutes after we close off, but I want to um, also let our viewers know where to find you. So can you tell us what are the best places to find Mark Wiley? Yeah, so um, tambulimedia.com, um, T-A-M-B-U-L-I media.com is a good place. Facebook is a good place. Um, I'm on Facebook and um, Tambuli is also on Facebook and has an Instagram page. And um, check out Transformations with Mark V. Wiley. There was a whole bunch of transformation podcasts. So I had to put with Mark V. Wiley to, to register it. But we're on all the podcast apps for listening, like Spotify and Google and Apple Podcasts, et cetera. And we're also on YouTube. You can watch the videos like this one of the same podcasts. Um, and um, it would be great to have more subscribers. We're still new. More people to hit like and share. You know how it is. Uh, and get that groundswell, get the groundswell. It's a very crowded space. Um, but when you love the content like you're doing and you love the things you're talking about, you really want to make it happen. For me, the podcast is like in the old days, in the 80s and 90s, I had to travel to schools, find a teacher, interview them with a little tape recorder, listen to it later and type it up. And now it's like we could just record it and you can be in Canada and I'm in Philadelphia and I have a, a a shaman coming on from Peru soon you know it's like we don't even have to be in the same area it's like the technology is amazing and we still get to do the interviews and we get to learn from people I mean for me that's the most that's the best part of doing it is the learning process um, I want to say one more thing if I can about one of the questions um, or some advice and my advice is if you feel really attached, if you feel like the arts resonate with you, um, map out a journey for yourself, you know, decide, do you want to travel to learn from a teacher? I mean, you've been to China to study and, and to collect tea and study tea and different things. And I've been, you know, a lot of countries learning martial arts and healing arts. Um, and there's a lot of teachers in the US, a lot of teachers in Canada, and then as you get more and more, uh, you know, save your money and travel to Asia, it, it's an experience you won't forget. And it puts some things into a greater perspective than just learning from somebody here in the West. Uh, read as much as you can. Read the classics uh, more than the newer stuff, although newer stuff's okay too. But if you really, really want to get in, make it a life journey and a, and a, a journey of self-knowledge and self-understanding. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mark Wiley. So you heard it, you heard it here first. You know where to find him. Uh, check out Mark, check out Tambuli, um, buy his books. And of course, you can buy my book. And I will say that it is a beautiful book and it's much more attractive, in my opinion, than the ones that you buy from Amazon. Um, the, anyway, um, and uh, and also check out check out the the transformations with Mark V. Wiley podcast because that is a really cool podcast. It's getting a like and a follow from me for sure, and you should do the same. So thanks for uh, joining us on the Dowie Expert Series podcast. I am going to turn off the recording now, and to everybody who isn't privy to our clo closing conversation, um, enjoy your practice, and uh, you know what to do. Take care. 
Thank you. Thank you.